Ghana has seen a lot of change over its 60 years of independence. Presidents have come and gone. Skyscrapers now stand where barren fields once lay. And technology now connects Ghanaians all over the world at an unprecedented level. Whatever the pace of change has brought, there has been one melodious constant that has been ever present in the lives of Ghanaians even before independence. And that is high life. Over time, Ghanaians have grown up with the unmistakable rhythms and melodies that have shaped our lives and brought us to dance and sing all our troubles away. My name is Mohammed Mahama, and on this program, I discuss high life as a genre of music and how modernism, social cultural changes, and other forms of music have affected this traditional type of music. High life started in the late 19th century and was inspired by the fusion of a number of elements, guitars, and the music of military bands in particular, combined to form music that would define a new nation. High life emerged from um, a sequence of uh, activities uh, by sailors who uh, come from Sierra Leone uh, to Ghana and down coast. And uh, that was the, uh, the genesis of um, uh, how her life began. You know, the activities of these people uh, came to Ghana and they brought their guitar. And the Ghanaians, Ghanaians also uh, studied how to play the guitar. And like the Sierra Leoneans, they tried to play some African music, uh, uh, music that pertains to them. In the 1870s, during the Ashanti Wars, mm -hmm. the British brought a lot of uh, Caribbean soldiers, tropicalized troops, and um, when the West Indians came, they brought in Afro-Caribbean rhythms, which are already halfway African, but playing, playing the music on brass bands, so that the, the Ghanaians who played brass band music quickly copied the, the West Indians. And even some of the songs that we know today, like uh, All For You, All For You, all for you. you and everybody likes Saturday night are actually calypso tunes which Ghanaians have adopted and then given new words to. So you could even say that high life is a fusion of African elements from Ghana, of course, it was born in Ghana, with a, 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 quite a heavy infusion coming in from the Caribbean and then finally Western uh, orchestration, Western instruments and harmonies. Guitar bands and concert parties were some of the first manifestations of early high life bands. The guitar bands would travel from town to town, performing stage plays about contemporary life and setting them to song. Professor John Collins was in one such band when the Ghanaian music industry was in its infancy. I, I came into the high life scene in the late 60s and I was playing with guitar bands or concert parties and at that time there were about 200 concert parties operating in the country. The main theme of the concert parties and the guitar bands in the 1950s and 60s was Abuse Ebone and Ajanka, you know, the Ajanka child and Broken Homes. They weren't singing about love. These are the guitar bands. The plays and the songs, the high life songs, were all about things you know, inheritance disputes, witchcraft in the family. Why were they singing all these things? Because they were making a, a commentary on the destruction of the traditional African family that was being fragmented by colonialism. So they actually contain a lot of wisdom or commentary, social commentary. The music first played along the Gold Coast had a number of different names. It was originally called Osibisiba or Odonson. The term high life came to the fore when dance bands, which generally played jazz and ballroom music for the elites, started adopting the local rhythms played by the guitar band. Oh. 
The dance halls were, were, were not easy, like today. You have to put on a tuxedo suit uh, or a kilte or a bow ties, and it was for the high class. So uh, th this music was classified the high life music of the people of Ghana. In the 1920s, some of the elites, the Ghanaian ballroom orchestras, started to also play some of these local tunes. And that's when the name High Life was invented by the poor people who were listening to the rich people, mainly playing ballroom music, but then on occasion they would play a local street melody, and so they called it High Class Life Music, High Life Music. In the 1940s and the 1950s, E.T. Mensa and the Temples were stars of a form of High Life Music fusing local rhythms with European ballroom music and brass instruments. This unique blend of instruments and styles birthed a new genre of music that is still unmistakably Ghanaian and hits straight to the core of the Ghanaian soul. High life is, is that rhythm I started hearing, if not from my mother's womb. <laughs> and uh, you listen to our music, our traditional music and all of that has that basic rhythm, basic core, basic drum beat. The British at the time probably wanted Ghanaians to play British music, eat British food and speak the British language, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of me uh, colonial mentality. Mm -hmm. But the Ghanaians were able to, in the, those conditions, create their own distinctive type of music. <laughs> Bands like the Tempo sung about love, relationships and hardships. But whatever the subject matter, the music got heads bopping and hips swaying. The music that formed moved the nation and inspired generations of musicians to come. Uh, I listened to Iti Mensa, uh, who had a very good guitarist called Tricky Johnson. They were closer to my hometown. So whenever they are on holidays, I'll go to Tricky Johnson to teach me a few tricks on the guitar. And uh, uh, I, I fancied also another guitarist called Pamela Crawfee, who played that for the Ramblers band. And uh, uh, I, I was also interested in E.T. Mesa himself, you know, the way he moved about, uh, playing her life, and her life being acceptable on the whole west coast of Africa. Grew up listening to all these records played by my dad from the likes of the Ampedus, the Opambos, the Obobaje Adolfos, and uh, the Aquisian Pofuejes, and I mean, yeah, host of them. I remember this one by Opambo, I think it was a favorite of my grandmother, Amagana. Amagana Mituana Mayako. Amagana Mituana Mayako. My grandfather was a half-life artist, my dad was, and then I am also one. I knew I was going to be a musician right from birth because when my dad used to play with uh, most of the bands, uh, even Marriott International Band, I was literally going everywhere with him. I mean, in my point from school, yeah, definitely, um, I go with him. So eventually, I knew I was going to be one. Even in school, even in the SS, you get it, where they write the subject, instead of, let's say, maths. You see me writing, music is my game there. And then beneath it, that's where I write my subject. As with High Life's birth, its progression saw it fuse with numerous other genres of music. In the 60s and 70s in particular, Ghanaian artists such as Ebo Taylor drew on a lot of influences from American soul music. In that era, James Brown was king and got people to the dance floor by making things funky. Like James Brown uh, and others, you know, uh, gave the, the, the fundamental uh, beat to our, our bass line which formerly it was going to, 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 it became to, 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 you know, it, it's changed in the formality of uh, the base structures of the band. Uh, her life is so flexible 
that is able to fuse with any form of music from any part of the world. Adult music, that's all. Modern high life artists have also used high life's malleability to make it more appealing to modern audiences. If you, if you look at the generation coming up, you realize that every generation had a certain kind of or a certain brand of high life music. So the next generation is, is exposed to well beats and um, beats which, which is kind of, um, let me say, danceable or kind of like has a lot of impact. You know, I mean, unlike uh, back in the days when our, our greats um, concentrate on the rhythm and the story and, um, you know, sometimes the style. But then these days, it goes like people want to jam to songs, people want upbeat songs and all of that. So, so you're putting everything in one. You're putting the story, you're putting the beat, you're putting the rhythm and everything, capture everything in one to suit today's generation. It is generations, things change. Eventually, it, it, some trends will change. You, you don't, like I said, you don't expect me to be only playing the Ambonza po, do, 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 to call it a high life song, no. Because with mine, I've modernized it. I, I do chord progressions, I do chord uh, modulations, I enter into this place and then come out. And that is great music. It doesn't get boring. You get it. So, um, and then other colleagues of mine has a way of doing it. He says the up tempos giving you great lyrics to even listen to. You get it. So eventually um, it will change. You get it, but it's still high life. It's high life time. The late 60s and early 70s saw Ghana rise to be the creative hub for West African music. There was a strong recording industry, pressing high life vinyls. Nightclubs all over the country had their own bands that competed with each other. And musicians like Ginger Baker and Fela Kuti came to Ghana for inspiration that helped them launch their career. From the late 60s right into the 70s, um, it was the era of soul music and rock music coming in from abroad, and particularly soul music, which was already Afrocentric. Say it loud, I'm black and proud. So this led to a huge upsurge in Afro-soul and Afro-funk, which Fela called Afrobeat. So that, that was a, a very creative phase. Achimoto College had 11 pop bands, just one college, one school. We had hundreds of pop chains. The youth were very experimental. A lot of music was going on. We had, we in fact, to be honest, in the late 60s, early 70s, Ghana was the mecca for West African music. It was the mecca. You've been gone in However, political upheaval in the 70s and the 80s led to a decline of the industry and generated a cultural shift. The military regimes put an end to all this because it was very difficult. I was running a band during the military era and I had to stop because you could get shot for playing music in the night if you break the curfew. The coup d'etat killed nightlife. At the time, live performances was a big deal. So all these bands were busy somebody was playing somewhere. The joints were busy. So when the coup d'etat came in, we were asked to sleep at six. So where are you going to perform? And who is coming to watch you? And who are you going to watch? Everybody is sleeping. So most of them went bankrupt. Business wasn't booming, including the owners of the pubs. The coups coincided with the decline of music education in schools and the exodus of a number of talented musicians since they weren't able to make a living in Ghana anymore. However, the coups and the resulting curfews had two interesting knock-on effects. Since the political climate meant that musicians couldn't play at night anymore, some started playing in churches in order to make a living. It is ironic that secular artists turned to the church since Christians at the time were very critical of Ghanaian dance music. The people who have really even helped us in holding the high life a bit is the gospel singers. Because 
If you look at all the songs that are released in Ghana, it is the gospel people who continuously play the high life. 60% of the whole output of this country is gospel. And it, it, you could, I mean, sometimes they draw on rhythm and blues or reggae, but fundamentally it's a, it's a high life mode. So the churches were keeping the high life going also. Another interesting effect of military rule was the birth of another form of high life that relied heavily on synths and drum machines, Bogger High Life. There was a coup d'etat, so some of our people traveled to Germany in particular, and they lived in a neighborhood called Hamburg. And so out of Hamburg, they brought music called Hamburg, or if you lived in Hamburg, it was called Hamburger. So, because of that, it's a bugger music. So it's bugger music, then we had High Life, which they buggered it, so they made it bugger High Life. And the uh, originator, or the first that we heard, was from a group led by George Darko, uh, with the Kuti Mofo. Well, Lumba Brothers, Nana Champong, Charles Kojufosu, Daddy Lumba, came out with Yaka Quintium. It was also not the norm. Uh, a groove of let's go dancing, uh, cool and the gang. Ta -ta, ta -ta, ta -ta, dun, 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 dun. You know, so you, you, they added the high life to it. And, uh, yeah, I can acquaint you. Uh, very big hit. Check it out, y'all. The 90s saw the growth of hip-hop around the globe, and its influence can be seen in some high life of the 90s in a new genre of music called hip-life that mixed American hip-hop with Ghanaian high life. With the birth and growth of hip-hop and competitions from other genres such as dancehall, Nigerian pop music, and Western pop music, it could be argued that traditional high life is in decline. I realized that her life uh, is no more uh, the, the desire of the people or the, the first choice at parties. Freedom, 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 freedom. They will prefer you, you play Charlie Wati, Shatta Wali, or want you to play uh, Kenata. I think the present generation is privileged with. Um, uh, 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 an all acceptable form of music as long as it moves boom, tick, boom, tick, for us all to dance. High life artists now aren't only struggling to compete with artists from other genres, they also need to struggle through various issues plaguing the Ghanaian music industry. Piracy and royalty collection are core issues that showcase the weak foundations the Ghana music industry is built on. We don't have a um, proper structure of music industry in Ghana, like a proper, proper structure. The biggest challenge is royalties. That's the biggest challenge. People just pirates because the law is there, but the enforcement is a problem. People even think that when they play your music or they, they pirate your music, they're helping you because they're making people know your music the more. If the policies are done well, they'll put the structures in place with the legal framework in place. The infrastructure that supports the creative industry is not there. Be it music or film or other things, you know. But aren't we the same country that are building stadiums all over the place? So it's, it's, it's a matter of decision whether as a country we are interested in developing the creative industry. Due to the lack of investment in the creative arts, and the divergence caused by political upheaval, it also seems that there is a gap between older and younger musicians. Essential music knowledge and skills are now in danger of being lost to younger generations because of the separation. Because of the gap that came between the 70s and the 90s, Top, top, top class musicians. Instrumentalists, I mean, when we say musicians, they're the ones who play instruments. They were not there to 
teach the younger ones. So today you find a lot of our people who just have the talent to sing, or the rudiments, the skill or the, the know-how, the schooling part, it's not there. Over time, I feel that um, it has suffered a bit because of um, the interest and uh, the ability to be able to do a good high life tune. You know what I mean? Because to record a high life tune requires a lot of live instruments and um, it requires a very good producer who understands like what he really needs to do, you know. So that I feel has been the challenge for the, for the new generation. These issues, along with the changing times and tastes, paints a bleak picture for the future of high life music in Ghana. However, high life still survives in a lot of popular Ghanaian music and that has allowed certain basic structures and rhythms to stay with us. Gamashi percussive rhythms, for instance, are still heavily used in popular music. The staying power of these aspects of high life gives cause for hope of a resurgence of the genre. You are research and you realize that all the hip life songs that made a major impact had 80% high life in them. But what is hip life? Hip life is a high life that we've wrapped on. Definitely, culture is dynamic. So the young people also wanted to come out with their own style of, which was okay. And it is, it is still okay. Over the years, when High Life evolved, we eliminated the guitars, but we kept the rhythm. So now you can play High Life without guitars. And that's what they are doing now. They are still playing the same old rhythms, but they don't play the guitars. But even Kim Promise, he does modern music with, if you listen to his new one, Selfish, you hear the choir guitar, all in that. So it, it tells you that they've not left it totally like people are perceiving. I have this theory, I mean, <laughs> about grandchildren. You see, I belong to the grandparents' generation. We were, let's say, the classical high life people. Okay, I'm a bit young for that group, but I'm still, I was sort of with them. And then we had the generation after me, which I think in Britain they call Generation X, but here you could call it the hip life generation, mm -hmm. which wanted to reject a lot of traditional things. Mm -hmm. But now their children have come. Mm -hmm. You call it the millennial generation, mm -hmm. and they've become very interested in what the grandparents knew. Mm -hmm. So the information isn't going to be lost. There is a strong sense among artists that high life will stay at our core, no matter whatever influences we pick up or mix music with. However, for the genre and for the entire creative industry to grow, certain structural changes need to be made to the industry. This would allow artists to flourish and would allow the creativity that made Ghana the hub of West African music manifest itself again. Ghana needs a lot more. And one major factor is also the fact that our political leaders, policy makers, um, ironically, they, they claim to want to create jobs for youth, yet they forget that the creative industry is the catalyst of creating jobs for youth. They will do all their budget and whatever, and the last thing they think about is creative industry. They, they really don't care. Anybody who ventures into creative art in this country, if you are not careful, you are doomed. We have no respect for creativity in this country whatsoever, including our policymakers. We have no respect for creativity. And something you have no respect for, you don't protect it. It is clear that music and the creative art scene in general needs a lot of investment and structure to protect it. What needs to be protected is not merely an industry or a genre of music but an essential piece of what makes us Ghanaian. The way our life, the influence our life has on the people of Ghana is tremendous and amazing. You know, even my, uh, uh, my, my little uh, grandson, you know, when he will start to move, you see. It's the voice of Ghana. It, it, it's not the voice of the, 
of the Akans. It's not the voice of the Gars or the Evis. It's a sort of a collective amalgam. High life can never be, be dead. I mean, high life is our soul. It is what we are. High life is going through a resurgence in many forms. Core elements are still prevalent in all popular genres in Ghana. And this shows us that there is still a deep love for our music. Love for our music must go beyond mere patronage and must evolve to advocacy as well. Go to High Life performances, buy or stream High Life music, encourage budding artists and reach out to policymakers to ensure that our artists thrive. And in the years to come, give us music that strengthens our connections to one another and make us dance and move as one. I fell deep in love with the Ifuab of Ma, a girl of my dreams. You see what I mean? On our wedding day, she gave me. Like me.